Welcome to Stream of Conscience, brought to you by Democracy for America, Fairfield County, where we believe that change is possible and you can make it happen. I'm your host, John Hartwell. Our guest today is Tom Nielsen, an old-fashioned troubadour whose life and songs take us to the front lines of social justice around the world. Tom began singing and performing during childhood in upstate New York, was an anti-war demonstrator during the Vietnam period, worked in Colombia and in Senegal in the 70s to improve public health, with rural development efforts in Africa and Nicaragua in the 80s, and here in the U.S. with people suffering from addiction and HIV in rural Massachusetts. Tom began recording his music at the end of the 80s, and he's won numerous awards and combined art with activism in appearances with Amy Goodman, Cesar Chavez, Noam Chomsky, Ralph Nader, Howard Zinn, and many other members of the progressive community. He's here today as we mark the second anniversary of Citizens United, the Supreme Court decision that opened the floodgates to corporate money and politics. Tom, it's an honor to have you here on Stream of Conscience. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's an extraordinary life you've led, uh, working all around the world <coughs> with uh, people who needed help, and, and, uh, and I'm sure at the same time, you learned a lot. How, how did all this, how did this, this start? What got you into social activism? I asked myself that too. I, I, if I were to credit anyone, it would probably be my mother. Because one of my earliest messages I can remember from her as a kid, when I was in kindergarten probably, was don't hurt anyone and clean up your mess. <laughs> she said, those are the only two things you need to learn. Right. And, and you'll, everything else will fall into place. Um, I was born on a little dairy farm in upstate New York where everybody had a farm. I watched our farms go out of business, not because we didn't know how to farm, but the way economics were worked and without getting into a treatise on agribusiness policies and, and small farms, um, it was stacked against us with Earl Butts, you remember, in 68 saying, use food as a weapon, get bigger, get out. Um, I saw, we went to Florida in 1955 when I was seven years old and I saw segregation and I could not believe some of the you know the signs that I was reading and my mom explained to me about segregation and how wrong that was and that was an imprinting and the inequality piece and and things of no one is better than anyone else nobody's life is more important than anyone else's just because someone has money doesn't mean they're better than you and these, these were very early messages, and she was also the one who taught me my music, had me performing when I was three and a half, mm -hmm. was my first solo. So when, in the, in the 60s, when it came time to be it for Vietnam, I felt I had a whole lot more in common with Vietnamese farmers than the brokers on Wall Street who were going to pay me to, to go kill them right. so they could make more money off Vietnamese labor and, and other resources. And so, I left the country, I went to, to South America. I mean, your words about me, your introduction is very gracious. There was certainly a lot of self-interest involved in that. I did want to see the world. I wasn't going to go to Vietnam. And I, I certainly had a, it, it's accurate to say, I did have a strong social justice component to my motives for things. And, and when I left the country, that opened up the world to me. When, before I left, Vietnam was something isolated. And when I left the country, I realized that the U.S. was fighting Vietnams in one way or another all around the world. So you went to Latin America first? First was from 70 to 74, I was in South America. Right. And, and, and then I, th I think I was on my way. That opened up the world. I realized how I, I became fluent in Spanish. Languages have always been easy for me. What did you do in, in Latin America? I worked in a ho with Hogari's Hogares Juveniles Campesinos and Children's Homes. I did health and, and I, I'm, I've always played sports. I've, I've always coached my whole life and been an athlete. And when people found that out, I immediately got co-opted by, I shouldn't say co-opted, incorporated <laughs> into the departmental sports agency. And so combining the other children's home work that I was doing in health, I began doing a lot of coaching and a lot of recreation and physical education, which is something I still teach. 
And then you went to Senegal. In 75, I left the country again and was in West Africa. I worked for an agency called Promotion New Men, and again, it was in, in public health. And was there until 78, went to Europe for a year, went to East Africa for another two and a half years or so, and Somalia with the United Nations. And so when you were working in these various <coughs> public health campaigns, uh, what did you find? What was the, in, the environment? Why, why is it that they don't have public health in Senegal or in, in Latin America? What was the... It's not that they don't have it. We have to, we have to begin from a point of who controls the resources how the resources are distributed. And how are the resources controlled and distributed? <clears throat> Let's take food, for example. Because to talk about public health, one needs to take a look at what makes health to begin with. And we can look right in, in this country as well, because it's the same things that are necessary a place to live, good food, nutritious food, mm -hmm. freedom from, from fear of that someone might come in and take what's yours, which happens mm -hmm. quite a bit, <clears throat> whether it's eminent domain in this country or whether it's some guy with a gun um, <clears throat> someplace else. And what, what has happened, let's say, in West Africa? A total incorporation of a nation's food supply, where you had, take the village I lived in. Historically, they would have grown, there were maybe 10, 12, and probably more words for millet and sorghum, different grains, grains that would, millet that would grow with a, hardly any rain at all, Mm. and, and a, a sweeter millet if you got more rain. And all these seeds would be planted and they would all grow together. And so even in a bad rain year, they would still have food. Something would come up. Something would come up. Mm -hmm. And then this is intermixed with the fish that was from a river nearby. There's other trees where the leaves are, are, are used to, for make sauces and that. And then agribusiness comes in. And people have no, farmers have no say in this. And agribusiness says, if you have, if you're doing four hectares for food, you're going to cut that in half. And I'm, I'm giving a for example. Mm -hmm. Half of what you're going to grow is for export now. It could be cotton, it could be ground nuts. The other half, or it could be rice, whole grain white rice, the other half of your land, you can still grow millet to eat. But to compensate because you have only half as much land, we're going to introduce this high yield variety seed. Remember Green Revolution, mm -hmm. high yield variety seeds. Well, these seeds don't have the natural resistance that the traditional seeds do. Mm -hmm. and, and what I'm saying now, you can parallel and, and place all around the world. These seeds all therefore need chemicals, pesticides, insecticides, and fertilizers. Mm -hmm. So you take a rural economy that is a barter economy. And a pretty much a subsistence economy. Yes. And, and it still is barter. In fact, a kilo of millet was worth a kilo of fish was worth a liter of milk. Mm -hmm. And that would just be still exchanged. But now, people would need money to buy all these fertilizers right. and pesticides. Where did they get the money? The seeds were given to begin with. Really? But they're also given credit. Mm -hmm. So what you introduce at the village level is a system of credit or indebtedness 
that one never gets out from under. And the collateral could be your horses, could be your farm, could be your land. And if people can't pay their debt, then they lose. Mm -hmm. And so, and in the meantime, these high yield seeds do not produce because these seeds need a more consistent amount of irrigation, a more consistent amount of rain in this case. They need an engineered environment. Yes. And that's the last thing you have in West Africa. Right. Um, I could give an example in, with, with, with the high yield rice gets real thick and it looks great and produces a lot but gets top heavy and falls down into the water and will rot. So, <coughs> so what you're saying here is that this, the development story of the last 20, 30, 40 years of going into what had been subsistence areas, introducing genetically engineered seeds that require then an entire ecosystem behind them to make them work has transformed the, the, the economy on the ground and basically made people dependent on others outside for credit and for necessities of life. It's introduced a system where money has replaced bartering. Mm -hmm. not, and, but not the GMO because you notice that virtually every country around the world is saying no to GMO. Many of them are, yes. You know, yeah. and more and more are. Right. And as it's too much to say virtually, are, but more and more. The yeah. European Union and more countries in Africa right. and Asia. They don't want it. But Vilsack and Obama keep pushing it. Right. But they're not going to take it. But yes. So what happens then is the, what the U.S. tries to do is to transform an economy to make it food dependent. And where are they going to get their food? From the United States. Mm. So countries that used to grow their own food now have corporations that come in. Corporations come in, they get the land. Villi farmers, villages, and this is, you can see this everywhere in the world, are displaced. They are forcefully displaced. If farmers don't want to grow the high yield seeds, they want to grow food, not something for export, because the money they get paid, they cannot turn around and buy the same amount of food. Or some corporation says, oh, we give jobs to farmers to come in, but someone gets 10 shillingi a day to do farm work, they can't take that and buy the same amount of food they could have grown if they just had their own land. Mm. And so it's creating poverty, it creates displacement, and then on top of that, when you come in with armies to get some resource, or when you have a proxy ruler in power, like when I was in Somalia, Siad Bari. Right. People hated Bari. And the whole refugee program I worked in was a sham. <clears throat> there weren't 1,500,000 refugees in Somalia. There were in the thousands. The, the herders were going back and forth every day. But the biggest uh, component of the Somali gross national product was the refugee business. Was the aid business. Right. And the, the foreign aid business. Yeah. And what that does is create dependency. And with the money and all the, everything that can be sold to whomever for whoever's benefit goes to prop up an unpopular ruler, in this case, Siad Bari. So how does this work into the music that you have been doing for the <coughs> last 20, 30 years? I mean, you're, you took this experience of working all over the world and working here in the United States for basically for social justice. And you've become, as I said in the introduction, a troubadour, someone who mm -hmm. goes around from place to place and sings about things which need to, to be known about. You're, you're not just an entertainer, you're someone who carries a message. Mm -hmm. and, and the message comes through your music in general. So how is it that, the, that your social justice experience has informed your music? Well, I was always singing, and my freshman year in college, I began writing songs for the guys in the, in the dorm to serenade their girlfriends okay. under the dorm windows. That's social, and not so much justice <coughs> necessarily. But that was, I had not thought about writing songs before then. And I got so much feedback and became a bit in demand mm. 
that I began writing songs. And that was when I was 17, 18. And as I slipped into the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement, began writing other songs and songs about these causes, songs about these issues. And when I left the country, I just kept writing and writing and writing. And then at the end of the, must have been, I, I, I would have come back from Somalia, I think, back to my doctoral program. And there, one of, one of the other students who knew my music said, you need to record your songs. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, who'd ever want to buy my music? Who, and who would pay me to play my music? And I went, I, I recorded with a, a man named Mark Lint, and then we recorded another one, and then we went separate ways. And people did like the music, and I've just, um, I get invited by environment groups around the country pretty much, mostly this side of the Mississippi, to um, coal incinerators of, you know, a wide variety of, you know, from, from burning trees to medical waste to poultry waste, um, nuclear energy, you know, and I help people organize with the music. And, you know, it was um, Pablo Casals said that the artist has a particular responsibility to use his or her venue, or a, a genre, or medium, I should say, to, to speak out for social justice, because we have a medium that will be listened to when others won't. You know, the spoken word, the editorial, the politician. But art is particularly effective if you're looking at a, a painting, or a play, or a poet, or music. And it's uh, it, it, a, a high school kid. I, I do high school programs. I do children's shows. I do just about everything. And one high school kid said, why do you do this? And I'd never been asked that. And I thought for a moment, and I said, well, I can't imagine not doing it. Because it's, you know, it's who I am. It's, it's what's flowing through me. And it's what I picked up in childhood you know, whoever the, the responsible people were for exposing me to what I was exposed to or the things that I saw that, that struck that inequality and need for equality nerve. And, you know, this isn't fair. This isn't right. And I have found that as an organizer, the, the music, hopefully, you know, is, is, a, is a tool that that helps educate, that helps spread the word, it helps inform. I'm one of my handles, I, I was once called the Bard Insurgent because I go from town to town mm. singing the news. That was put on me a long time ago. But when I go to high school classes, these high school students want to, they, they're sponges. Right. And they ask, they all ask the same thing, why don't we learn this? Why, why, how do you know this and we don't? And the thing is, you can get the information, but you have to want to get it. When you ask how people can be uh, sources of change and, and effective, you have to want to do it. Because for the most part, our media is not going to give us this information. But if you want it, you can find it, especially with the net and until they censor it, if, which you know, people, people in this country should be outraged with what is coming down. Citizens United first, you mentioned that in the introduction. The fact that the president has just signed away the Constitution, that the Senate voted for it 93 to 7 to suspend the Bill of Rights. Mm. I mean, what other, what other countries have done that? Think about this. Pinochet in Chile suspended the Constitution. The Guatemalan generals, you know, suspended it with uh, <coughs> our Benz and in Santo Domingo with Juan Bosch. Hitler suspended it, a democratic constitution. You know, what is the company we are keeping when you look at democracies around the world in this century, last century? That's who we are in bed with. 
you know, and this country should be outraged at that. Well, we've asked you here today to sing a couple of songs, and uh, I certainly look forward to, to hearing that and to, to talking more. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been a real pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you. Uh, so here's Tom Nielsen performing his own song, Corporations Are Human. Corporations are human, I just found out What being human is all about Citizens United, ancestral line Their corporate gene is different from mine Yeah, the science is in, there's nothing to doubt They never get cancer, gonorrhea, or gout Encephalitis, cystitis, neuropathy Colitis, hepatitis, A, B, and C Fibrosis, sclerosis, and heart disease. Halitosis, cirrhosis, and a pair of bad knees. They don't need a dentist or protection with sex. Because they live forever, it's not that complex. Corporations are human, I just found out. What being human is all about Citizens United, ancestral line Their corporate gene is different from mine People have faces in socks in a drawer Corporations are faceless here and offshore If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more Yeah, their money has free speech to me, quite a shock Cause I never heard my money talk When a corporation has a colonoscopy Then I believe they're human like me <clears throat> And now, here's Tom singing, These Colors Don't Run the World. There's a drone in the air in Pakistan Paramilitaries on Columbia plan Samsara we was hanging from a crane Shell and Chevron in Ogoni domain Rahm Emanuel can bully junior senators To vote for war in Afghanistan And Gates and Clinton can rattle their sabers To make combat with Iran Oh, you can feel how you will Every time you see old glory unfurled But these colors don't run these colors don't run These colors don't run the world Obama says we've lost South America But I can still find it on a map He says we need 50,000 mercenaries So we can occupy Iraq you can blockade the people of Cuba You can blockade information flow You can bomb via 
Vietnam to the Stone Age and torture in Guantanamo and you can feel how you will every time you see old glory unfurled but these colors don't run these colors don't run these colors don't run the world Build a wall on the border with Mexico Build another in Palestine Build a wall in the hearts of our people While the truth you undermine You can love this country or leave it You can wave the red, the white and blue You can get child labor with Walmart And when you wear those Nike shoes And you can feel how you will Every time you see old glory unfurled But these colors don't run these colors don't run these colors don't run the world contras kill civilian populations destroy their clinics and their schools their croplands and water systems till we decide which the most rules you can say they our freedoms but look at the damage that we've done to get every precious metal and fossil fuel and their labor under our thumb and you can feel how you will every time you see old glory unfurled but these colors don't run these colors don't run these colors don't run the world yeah, these colors don't run. These colors don't run. These colors don't run the world. Thank you. Thank you. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. If you live in the town served by Cablevision from Norwalk, you can catch our show every Wednesday on Channel 88 at a new time of 8 p.m. If you're interested in learning more about progressive political action in Fairfield County, please check out our Democracy for America group. We meet the first Wednesday of the month, 7 to 9 p.m., at the Silver Star Diner in Norwalk. We always welcome new members. Remember, change is possible, and you can make it happen. This has been Stream of Conscience, and I'm your host, John Hartwell. We hope to see you again soon.